controversial question of how life began has puzzled mankind for thousands of years. There are two schools of thought. One idea is that God is the master of nature, the creator and ruler of the universe, who designed each kind of life on Earth with deliberate intention. This concept is known as creation science, or abrupt appearance. An opposing view, which is predominant in today's society and scientific community, is known as evolution. It teaches that non-living matter unintentionally changed into life and developed with time. Single-celled forms progressed into more complex multi-celled forms, resulting in the ultimate development of man. The principles of evolution influence every aspect of our society. Around the world, prestigious museums display evolutionary perspectives. National parks and historical sites have become showcases for evolutionary information. Science magazines, geography and natural history publications, children's books, and TV specials present evolution to the public as fact. Many of today's most popular films, amusement parks, and even breakfast cereals promote evolutionary concepts to eager audiences. Textbooks that develop evolutionary theories are compulsory reading for public high school, college, and university students. Evolution has become the foundation for most scientific disciplines, including paleontology, geology, biology, and astronomy. The aim of many scientists is to eliminate supernatural explanations and provide naturalistic answers. Consequently, many must reject God's supernatural intervention in a miraculous creation. Carol Matriciana, born and raised in India, is author of Gods of the New Age and co-author of the book The Evolution Conspiracy, A Quantum Leap into the New Age. While there are some scientists who believe in a creator God, most believe in physical evolution that is, life forms becoming more complex with time. Many of these scientists would discount that there is any spiritual evolution going on. However, there are an increasing number, persuaded by one of today's popular worldviews known as the New Age Movement, who are using the concepts of biological evolution to springboard into spiritual evolution. Many prophesy a development, claiming that the next stage of man's evolution will be in spiritual terms. A quantum leap from biological evolution into a mystical emergence. I think that man is evolving into a state of higher awareness, higher consciousness, higher vibration. And I think that the best representation that we have of man's movement in that direction is what's going on in the consciousness movement, new age movement. Evolution is going on all the time. Many people believe, and I believe, that the purpose of life is to grow, and that you grow as much as you can in each lifetime. And of course, we believe in reincarnation. The parallel ideas of reincarnation and evolution have always been closely linked to the occultic beliefs of many of the world's pagan religions. But during the mid-19th century, this philosophy was suddenly given scientific respectability worldwide by an Englishman, Charles Darwin, who has become known as the father of evolution. The majority opinion of the day held to the biblical account of a creator god who intentionally designed each basic form of plant and animal. Although raised a Christian, Darwin rebelled against this idea and in his theory saw a way to formulate a process without a creator. This is the home of Charles Darwin between 1842 and 1882. It's in this study that Charles Darwin produced his great works. In fact, he used to sit in this chair. It's here he wrote his famous On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. Charles Darwin is a giant among men in modern world because he developed the theory of evolution which transformed the scientific world. The theory of evolution by natural descent was in vogue long before Darwin's time. What Darwin did was provide a rational explanation of how it might have operated. So rational indeed that many people said, why didn't I think of that? Many people felt most comfortable. As far as Darwin was concerned, he was their hero. He provided the, the explanation that they were seeking. 
Modern science was born in 1620 when Lord Bacon wrote Novum Organum. Between 1620 and 1860, most scientists believed in the creator and in the creation of man. Today, few scientists believe in creation or a creator. What happened? Who are some of the molders of the modern mind? Standing here by Thomas Huxley in the Museum of Natural History, he's been called Darwin's bulldog because he took the theory of Darwin and gave a forceful presentation of it. Huxley believed that you could explain everything in nature apart from the creator by pure natural laws. We have to remember that after all, creationism was what everybody thought not all that many years ago. And creationism was overthrown in the scientific community by evolutionary thinking. For the most part, Darwin's book was considered blasphemous by the average, average person in England at that time. Karl Marx, an atheist and the originator of communism, was delighted to find a scientific rationale in the theory of evolution, which he claimed gave validation to his new philosophy. Marx admired Darwin, and the two communicated and corresponded. In appreciation, Marx even attempted to dedicate his greatest atheistic work, Das Kapital, to Darwin. There were communists of the day, and Karl Marx was one of these, who saw Darwin's theory as giving scientific credibility to what was previously a, merely a philosophy, the philosophy of socialism, the philosophy of communism. It all became scientific and credible with Darwin's theory. Roger Oakland is a former evolutionist and biology instructor and is co-author of the book, The Evolution Conspiracy, A Quantum Leap into the New Age. When the communists took over Yuanling province of China, the entire population was forced to attend propaganda classes. The first lesson was not some words of wisdom from Lenin or Stalin, but a fundamental course in Darwinian evolution. One of my former graduate students turned to communism. He was brought to Moscow for training. What do you think they taught him? Lenin, Marx? No. For two years, they sat him in a library and taught him nothing but evolution, identifying it as the foundation of communism. Without evolutionism, there can be no Marxism, no Leninism, no secular humanism, unless the universe created itself, unless man is God, unless there is no creator. None of these philosophies will stand. The people who have devised the concept of evolution starting with Charles Darwin himself, and even before him, have come up with a concept that starts with a vacuum. And then there was an explosion in that vacuum called the Big Bang that created the uh, Milky Way galaxy with up to 200 billion stars, all circulating in intricate precision. The result of that explosion and gets all the way up to man without God getting into the act anywhere along the line. That is really the way it is taught in all of our public schools today. Darwin's whole purpose was to explain all of life without design and purpose, without the need for a creator by purely mechanistic or natural processes. Luther Sunderland, former aerospace engineer and author of the book Darwin's Enigma. Now, what is this materialistic or natural explanation for evolution? It says that on the early Earth, in a soupy ocean, some chemicals got together and formed spontaneously the first living cell. Now, that was no minor operation because the simplest single-celled organism we know anything about has in its genes and chromosomes about as much data as there are letters in the world's largest library, the trillion letters. No way in the world could random processes have organized that much data. Most life forms are comprised of billions of these complex cells, which once again display themselves in perfect order. The mathematical impossibility of the human body being formed accidentally surpasses the logic of an explosion in a printing shop resulting in the formation of a dictionary. We are told that life began in this prebiotic soup, which was rich in all sorts of various compounds. But recent studies in the most ancient rocks show that there's no evidence that such a soup ever existed. The scientific method is supposed to be based on the ability to observe and test things. 
And yet, evolutionists accept that non-living matter somehow became life. No one saw it happen. There's no examples of it happening today. And yet, they claim it as a fact. In addition, no one has ever observed one form of life evolving into another form. But evolutionists are convinced that if you give it billions of years of time, these things can happen. You see, long periods of time become the magic factor. Suppose someone walks into a science classroom at a university and claims that it's possible for a worm to become a man in just a few seconds of time. He's laughed out of the building. Someone else makes a claim that a worm can become a man given millions of years of time, and everyone there agrees. You see, by simply expanding the amount of time, a ridiculous idea seems credible. And that's the key to evolution. As little as 120 years ago, the public at large generally accepted that the Earth was relatively young. One possibility indicated six to 10,000 years based on biblical genealogies. Today, however, evolutionists have invented complex timetables spanning billions of years, specifically designed to allow vast amounts of time for various life forms to change into other life forms. No one knows precisely how old the Earth is, but no matter how much time one gives an evolutionist, it still doesn't solve their dilemma as to how exactly life came into being in the first place. Dr. John Morris, Associate Professor of Geology at the Institute for Creation Research in California. You know, there are hundreds of different clocks by which we can estimate the age of a rock or the age of the Earth, and almost all of them seem to give young ages for all of these things. There are about five or six, however, that seem to give old ages. It's interesting that my evolutionary colleagues will always choose those old ones. These dates are then substantiated through biased dating methods, such as radiometric dating. Although presented as objective and reliable, the results of radiometric dating are rejected if they do not agree with the preconceived evolutionary time frame. When a scientist wants to date a rock, he sends it to a lab, but you know that lab won't even take that rock unless he sends in a form with it telling them exactly how old he thinks that rock is, and that gives them a target to shoot for. And on the machine, they would keep turning those knobs and keep working on it until they got that date. Many times when we read in the textbooks about a rock that's been dated so many billion years, we just assume that the people that have gathered those dates know what they're talking about. But that's not the case. I know how those dates are arrived at. Until Darwin, many scientists were in agreement with the biblical account that animals produce after their own kind. But as the evolutionary perspective was given more authority, Scientists were under pressure to prove Darwin's hypothesis and explain how life forms could possibly have changed from one form into another. Now we are told that the way evolution proceeds is damages due to some outside influence like cosmic rays caused the cell to make mistakes. We call those mutations. And gradually one organism is supposed to have changed into another organism all the way from a single cell to invertebrates like clams or starfish, and then the vertebrate fishes, the amphibia, the reptiles, birds, mammals, and finally man. And here we are now, the product of billions of mistakes. Scientists know the genetic code prevents one life form from changing into another kind. So they speculate that mutations or damages to the DNA must be responsible for evolutionary processes. Again, they believe this in spite of the observable evidence that no new species has ever resulted from a mutation. Mutations are almost always harmful. They can bring about small adjustments in a particular species, but no way are they able to change one kind of creature into another. If evolution has really occurred, we ought to be able to see the evidence in the fossil record. After all, that's the record of the past. But if we look at that fossil record carefully, we see that there are no recorded instances of one type of an animal ever changing into another. There's no transitional forms. One of my advisors is uh, working in, in the field of paleontology and has been working on the uh, distribution of fossils in the record and has found that uh, there are no interspecific transitional forms, something that, of course, the creation model would have predicted and did predict long before this research was done. We ought to see cats, and we ought to see dogs, and we ought to see cogs and dats. We ought to see them in between. We ought not to be able to divide them like we are now. But that doesn't usually stop my evolutionary colleagues. They will make the statements over and over again that the, the fossil record is replete with these transitional forms. There are myriad transitional forms. Uh, 
uh, th there's really no problem uh, finding transitional forms. Well, it's completely false to say that there's a, a lacking of uh, transitional forms. We have plenty of them, more than sometimes we can cope with. In fact, there are so many transitional forms between species that we must often fall back on statistical analysis to separate one from the other. So the claim that there are no intermediates is simply a false claim. During their interviews, several of these prominent scientists contradicted themselves, admitting that no transitional forms had been found and proceeded to offer excuses for the lack of evidence. And the problem of transitional forms <coughs> is one that all honest uh, paleontologists have a problem with. The uh, geologic record is incomplete. Uh, it's incomplete because of erosion that has eroded things away. One of the things that uh, also uh, makes it a little more difficult in the fossil record is the rapidity with which uh, evolution acts in very s short bursts. Um, it doesn't leave many transitional forms behind. Let's go to the British Museum of Natural History to the man who wrote the book there on evolution, Dr. Colin Patterson. I wrote to Dr. Patterson and asked him why he didn't put a single picture of an intermediate form or a connecting link in his book on evolution. Dr. Patterson now, who has seven million fossils in his museum, said the following when he answered my letter, quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I certainly would have included them, unquote. Later, he said, I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one might make a watertight argument. Since Darwin's time, evolutionists have aggressively searched for vital fossil evidence to support the idea that life forms evolved. Even Darwin admitted that his own theory was worthless speculation without invaluable fossil proof for transitional forms. In collaboration with evolutionists, Oil companies have drilled wells throughout the world, examining layers of the earth to depths in excess of five miles. Of the millions of fossils unearthed, not one sample of a transitional form has been discovered. Over the years, the research of geology and archaeology have also failed to produce evidence that supports evolution's claims. In Darwin's time, there was not a single example of anything that has come to be known as a missing link. In fact, it was not until almost the time of his death that a fossil bird was discovered in Bavaria, I believe. It was named Archaeopteryx, that was, for all intents and purposes, intermediate between reptiles and birds. That was a triumph of his hypothesis. Archaeopteryx, classified today by many paleontologists as a true bird, not a reptile bird intermediary, was the first of a number of deceptive schemes promoting evolutionary ideas. Evolutionists misdated and misidentified this extinct bird, presuming it to be the missing link between reptiles and birds. The best example of a transitional form that my evolutionary friends usually give is Archaeopteryx, a supposed link between the reptiles and the birds. Recently, a, another bird has been found dated by evolutionists to be 75 million years older than, than Archaeopteryx. So therefore, Archaeopteryx could certainly not be the ancestor of the birds. Actually, evolutionists don't have any idea how the reptiles evolved into birds. They don't have any of these transitional forms. But that doesn't stop them. You pick up any book on evolution, and Archaeopteryx is still presented as the best evidence. Archaeopteryx here is a good example of a transitional form because it shares characters which we ordinarily think of being typical either of birds or dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx is right halfway between, and it's for this reason that many of us are inclined to call birds reptiles. The next time you have a Thanksgiving dinner, you can, you can tell people that you're eating dinosaurs. Uh, reptiles are supposed to have converted their scales into feathers. Now, a scale in a reptile is nothing but a fold in the skin. Now, how in the world could a fold in the skin have ever been frayed out into the intricate design of a feather? There's never been anything found intermediate between the fold in the reptile skin and the feather of a bird. In the evolution of flying creatures, 
uh, an animal's forelimb, good for walking or climbing, must have gradually changed into a wing. We have never found any fossils that show this in-between structure. I suspect that such a creature, long before he had a good wing, had a lousy forelimb, and he could neither have walked nor flown. The whole idea is ludicrous. Because no fossil records exist to confirm evolutionary assumptions, dubious artworks are relied upon and exhibited as fact. Misleading artistic interpretations depict fish magically growing legs and changing into amphibians. Extinct deer-like creatures mysteriously turning into horses and monkeys becoming humans. Where non-existent transitional skeletons are needed to prove a point, skilled craftsmen substitute plastic and wooden models. I'm very concerned about the way our museums present evolution as though it were a proven fact. And actually, false information is being presented. You see, since the museums don't have the transitional forms, they have to make them up out of thin air. The November 1980 edition of Science Digest shows a drawing of a whale with legs as an evolutionary link between whales and cows. But the only fossil evidence for this mythological transition is a skull and several teeth, no leg bones. Niles Eldridge at the American Museum said, you're only limited by the credulity of your audience and your own imagination in making up these stories of what changed into what and what the intermediate forms were. When asked to come up with evidence that evolution really has taken place, evolutionists will frequently bring up very minor changes in, in uh, living things, such as insects becoming resistant to DDT or insects changing color. Can we see evolution taking place today? You certainly can. We can. Um, one of the most spectacular examples, have you ever heard of the San Jose scale? San Jose scale is an insect that infects oranges. The thing has evolved to resist the pesticides that they were using on it. One can see in historical times uh, examples of evolutionary change. For example, uh, if one looks at uh, attempts to eradicate particular pests uh, with different kinds of insecticides, uh, it turns out that within a normal population of a particular kind of insect, for example, there are some that are resistant to a particular kind of insecticide. This is not evolution. Evolutionists should know better. These small changes are totally compatible with the creation understanding of things. What we need to see is major changes, some type of an animal changing into another type of an animal, and this we do not see. If we're talking about seeing evolution today, uh, seeing one species changing into another species, uh, that's not going to happen. Although there must be, from an evolutionary perspective, many transitional forms out there, the likelihood of finding any one of them is extremely low. The more we learn about paleontology, that is fossils, the more certain we are that evolution is based on faith alone. The National Academy of Science is the official advisor to the U.S. government on questions of science. In its publications, it falsely claims that the missing links that troubled Darwin are no longer missing. This is misrepresentation which deceives millions because after 120 years of exhaustive searching, Darwin's missing links are still missing. Yet this academy and evolutionists continue to perpetuate the mythical theory that man developed from ape-like creatures. Richard Leakey, who is one of the most uh, well-known anthropologists, said that if he were asked to draw a family tree for man, he would just have to draw a huge question mark because the evidence is too scanty to possibly know man's evolutionary origin, and he didn't think we're ever going to find it. To aid and abet evolutionary concepts, artistic depictions have gone beyond ethical boundaries. Despite having no foundation for the ape-to-man theory, scientists and artists continue to dupe the public with lifelike but imaginary illustrations. These artists vainly entertain natural progressions of apes to humans and presume their hair color, skin tones, and even facial expressions from no more than a tooth, a piece of bone, or even no evidence at all. National Geographic magazine, which doesn't attempt to hide its evolutionary bias, admits that these fossilized footprints are identical to human footprints. Yet artists take the liberty to accommodate evolutionary theory and illustrate ape-like features to fit ape-like creatures. 
all because biased dating processes insist that these footprints were found in rock layers said to exist before humans. Now, today we have evolutionists who would like us to believe there is solid evidence for evolution. Before the public, they generally create the impression that the evidence is just like solid gold, that man has evolved from some ape-like creature. Dr. Donald Johansson, director of the Institute of Human Origins, discovered Lucy, an alleged ape-to-man missing link. The human family and the ape family diverged and went on their own individual and separate evolutionary trajectories. We don't know precisely the, the, what the common ancestor was for that, but we know that it resembles something like what is called Ramapithecus. Ramapithecus. That was formed out of nothing but a fragment of a jaw and several teeth. And for many, many years, Ramapithecus was held up as our ape-like ancestor. But now Dr. Pillbeam at the Yale Harvard Peabody Museum, when I interviewed him, he said, we have found about 40 of these creatures now, some of them fairly complete, and they are not on the direct line to becoming man at all. They're more like an orangutan. Dr. Pillbeam of Yale, who first claimed that Ramapithecus was an ancestor of man, now suggests that it isn't. Yet evolutionists continue to cite Ramapithecus as an ape-man link. Another so-called missing link, Java Man, was concocted by Eugene Dubois when he found an ape-like skull fragment, and then 50 feet away he found a human leg bone. However, just before he died, Dubois confessed that he'd also found two human skulls at this same location and he admitted that the skull fragment belonged to a gibbon and not to an ape man. Homo erectus is probably best known as Java man. And it was at this stage in human evolution that they began to make and use these large triangular hand axes. Brains expanded over a thousand cc's. Uh, body proportions similar to ours evolved. And we were firmly on the road uh, to later hominids, including modern humans. This hoax is still accepted by evolutionists today, and it's presented to the public as a true missing link. If you think the Java Man hoax is incredible, wait until you hear all the facts surrounding Johansson's Lucy, this little three and a half foot adult skeleton, which looks just like a chimpanzee. Uh, as you know, Lucy was found in 1974, and sometimes I refer to her as the woman who shook up man's family tree, because she represents for us the oldest, most complete skeleton we have of any human ancestor known to anthropologists. Now, the species Australopithecus afarensis, as represented by Lucy, is a species that we feel is ancestral to modern humans. And the significance of Lucy is that she gives us a good idea of what our ancestors looked like some three million years ago. We can learn from her skeleton about the way that she walked, for example. When we look at her knee joint, when we look at her pelvis, we see that she walked like you and I, instead of like a chimpanzee. Johansson said, even though this is a very ape-like creature, it walked upright. Well, the pygmy chimp today wanders around in the rainforest, walking upright almost all the time. So that doesn't prove anything. Actually, the only features of Lucy which even hint at erect posture are the knee and, and hip joints. Dr. Charles Oxnard, with a sophisticated computer analysis, has concluded that Johansson's claims for the hip are unfounded, and it must be pointed out that the knee was not even found with Lucy. This knee joint was found over a mile away, 200 feet deeper than the other bones. She comes closer to representing, I think, what the average person thinks of as the missing link than any other fossil we had, had ever found in Africa. So she has extraordinary importance in terms of understanding the very earliest phases of human evolution. Richard Leakey and others are now claiming that in all likelihood Lucy is really a mosaic of, of two or more species. This isn't funny. What is funny is that they claim that creation isn't scientific. Uh, the next thing back was Piltdown Man. Here was a case where a human skull had been doctored up along with a jaw of an orangutan to make the jaw look somewhat human. The teeth were filed. It turned out to be a pure fraud. Piltdown Man was a 
purposeful fraud and it fooled the world's greatest evolutionists simply because they so much wanted to believe that there was some evidence for evolution. Neanderthal man was originally found in the Neanderthal Valley of Germany. These creatures almost all look very modern, but several of them, two or three, had a very stooped over, brutish appearance. Now, however, two scientists have gone over to the museums in Europe from Johns Hopkins University, got these bones out of the museums and x-rayed the ones that had a very stooped over appearance. And lo and behold, they discovered that the stooped over creatures had rickets or some vitamin D deficiency disease such as arthritis. They have reclassified the Neanderthals from a separate species, now put them back into Homo sapiens, the same as modern man. Now, Nebraska man consisted of nothing but a single tooth. And around this single tooth, pictures were drawn showing an ape-like creature that had evolved into man. It turned out later that this tooth was nothing but the tooth of an extinct pig. And this is a case now where uh, a pig made a monkey out of an evolutionist. I think man has always been man. The scientific evidence shows this, and this, of course, is very consistent with the account of creation that is presented in the book of Genesis. Behind closed doors, or occasionally when speaking very candidly, the evolutionists admit there is really no evidence that man evolved from the apes. The evolutionists realize that they can no longer rely on the fossil record to give them any support. So what they've done is they've come up with a very crafty alternative to the Darwinian concept of evolution. They call it the punctuated equilibria concept. One of the really exciting developments in evolutionary theory in the last uh, 10 to 15 years has been the theory that uh, Instead of evolving very gradually over a long period of time, uh, that evolution came in short bursts that were interspersed with uh, much uh, longer periods where virtually nothing happened. You see, this solves all kinds of problems intellectually for the evolutionist. He doesn't have to look at the fossil record. There is no evidence in the fossil record that one type of animal ever changed into another type of animal. Punctuated equilibria comes along and says that isolated populations of animals evolved rapidly and left no fossil trace. But this is an argument from lack of data. There are no transitional forms, and that's used then as proof of the brand of evolution called punctuated equilibria. This is bad science. With this new information, we're trying to refine our view of evolution. And uh, what's emerging is a much more powerful synthesis uh, of the evolutionary theories. I'm convinced that the idea of punctuated equilibria is really a desperate attempt to salvage evolutionary theory. Punctuated equilibrium, while attempting to explain the lack of intermediate forms between neighboring species, neglects to address the real issue that asks why there are no transitions between major categories of life forms. One extraordinary answer was offered by Goldschmidt's hopeful monster theory. Who would believe, for instance, that a reptile laid an egg and a bird came crawling out of the egg, as Goldschmidt had said about this theory when he first came up with it? We are literally going back to the very foundations of evolutionary principles and reevaluating once again the mechanisms whereby evolution takes place. Unfortunately, I think a number of uh, those outside the scientific fields uh, that deal with evolution interpret this as a uh, casting doubt on the very, uh, of the, what I would call the fact of evolution. What it does say to us is that the evolutionists are running scared. It seems like almost every new development in science is converging to destroy evolution. Whether we're talking about new discoveries in astronomy or in paleontology or biology, this is true. I suddenly realized that there was very little evidence for the theory of evolution, and yet I had just accepted it as truth uh, from a very young age. I just realized, finally, after studying all this material and thinking this thing through, that the evidence, the scientific evidence for creation, is a lot stronger than the scientific evidence for evolution. In the last decade, most of the basic pillars upon which evolution has stood have collapsed and the theory is in chaos. Now, unfortunately, at this time, 
the evolutionists are crying louder than ever before that evolution is a fact. Well, it's my personal view that evolution is a dead certain fact. Evolution. There is no question that it happened. The geological record cannot be explained in any other way than through uh, the evolutionary process. Many times you'll hear the statement that evolution is a fact, but a scientist should know better than to make a statement like that. If evolution has ever occurred, it was not observed, and therefore it's outside the realm of science. It's inaccessible to scientists and the scientific method. Many of my evolutionary colleagues are, are coming up with, with rather bizarre theories. It seems that they recognize that evolution doesn't make good sense scientifically, and so they're, they're forced to come up with these incredible imaginary ideas. For instance, some now recognize that uh, the spontaneous generation of life from non-life is, is scientifically impossible. So what do they do? Do they, do they attribute it to a creator? No, they, they claim that life came from outer space. Well, they can believe that if they want to, but they shouldn't call it science, and they shouldn't teach it in schools as if it were science. Evolution is simply a matter of making up stories in place of the actual scientific data. Science used to be the search for truth. Now it seems it's deteriorated into the search for a believable story. The scientist who can make up the most plausible sounding story and can get it printed or get the media to tell about it, he is the one that becomes famous. I can say that as a scientist I see zero evidence that evolution has occurred or that any is going on today. One scientist I spoke with said that even if evolution is not true, there is no way it could ever be retracted because it had gone too far. Millions of textbooks would have to be reprinted, and museums all over the world would have to tear down their exhibits. Society would never trust science again. In July of 1925, the trial of the century took place in Dayton, Tennessee. For the first time in educational history in this land, the concept of a creator was totally challenged. This was the great turning point. Up till 1925, all of your science classes taught creation. Today, all that you have taught in the science classroom is evolutionism. John Scopes, a school teacher, was found guilty of violating Tennessee law, which prohibited the teaching of human evolution. Less than 10 years later, by 1933, the Humanist Manifesto was signed by a small but powerful group of people presenting themselves as a non-profit religion. Their religion was humanism, and it swept through the educational system through the zealous pursuits of John Dewey, a socialist and first president of the American Humanist Association. Today, public schools are the seminaries for Dewey's religion of humanism, and its doctrine of evolution dominates the educational system. Now, today we do have religion being taught in our public schools. The fundamental tenet of humanism, for instance, as listed right in the Humanist Manifesto, tenet number one, religious humanist regard the universe as self-existing, it was not created. Tenet number two, man is the product of a long natural process, that is evolution. A very few people originally got control of our education system in this land. One of the things that was imperative for them to push through their programs was evolutionism. Most people do not believe that evolution happened. The fact that most scientists do, or practically all scientists do, is in a sense neither here nor there, because in fact uh, we would like the ideas uh, to get across to our students. The thing that the average Christian in America has never realized is that his tax dollars pay the school teacher's salary, they pay for the textbooks, and yet most parents still will not say one word about anything that happens in that classroom that disturbs them. For parents to allow a godless indoctrination in evolutionism is just unthinkable. Thousands of children are bused daily to our museums as part of school-sponsored field trips where they're given crash courses in evolution. And just like in the Soviet Union, this religion of atheism is presented as fact with no alternate viewpoints allowed to be expressed. Attorney Wendell Byrd argued the case for balanced treatment of creation science and evolution before the U.S. Supreme Court. He is author of the book, The Origin of Species Revisited. 
To me, the basic issue is academic freedom because no one's trying to exclude evolution from public schools while teaching a theory of creation. Instead, the evolutionists are trying to exclude alternatives while, in general, defending the exclusive teaching of evolution. Well, I think creationism should be taught in schools simply because all good ideas should be taught in schools. I think we shouldn't be afraid of ideas, whether, whether we oppose them or whether we're, we're for them. I think we should expose everyone to both sides of the issue. Eighty-six percent of the American public believes that the theory of evolution ought to be taught along with the scientific theory of creation according to an AP NBC News nationwide poll. I think creation should be taught in schools because it's, bit, it's a part of what we are in, I think it should be taught with an open mind as, without religious intonations. Lawyers nationwide, more than two to one, agree that it is constitutional to teach the theory of creation along with the theory of evolution. And lawyers better than two to one believe that both should be taught in public schools. Uh, yes, creation should be taught in uh, schools. Equal time should be given to evolution and creation. 42.3% of biology teachers believe in teaching a theory of creation along with the theory of evolution. And the same is true of school board members, two-thirds according to a poll by the American School Board Journal. The fact is that contrary to all of the smoke, the great majority of the American public feels that it is unfair to teach just the theory of evolution. No more than 6% have ever wanted only evolutionism taught, but there is such total domination and control in the scientific community that we still are placating the 6% of the people in this land who believe there is no God and believe that the universe created itself. Well, since there's no one answer and you can't prove the past yet, then both ideas should be taught. The only fair approach is to let the children hear all of the scientific information and make up their own minds. Should other concepts of how life got started be taught in the public schools? I don't think creationism should because creationism is a thinly disguised religious doctrine which has got no place in, in uh, the separation of church and state. The main issue that is always raised in opposition to teaching all the scientific evidence on the subject of origins is that it violates separation of church and state to teach evidence that doesn't happen to support evolution. People should simply be able to hear the truth. A fact is a fact. You don't throw it out just because it happens to agree with the Bible. That doesn't make it religious. Teaching a theory of creation is constitutional because the Constitution was written in the context of the Declaration of Independence which refers to creation and even to a creator. In response to public outcry for the presentation of creation science alongside evolution, Louisiana and Arkansas were the first states to pass laws mandating balanced treatment for both theories. It was agreed that only scientific data minus religious doctrines be presented in the classrooms. The Louisiana legislature in 1981 passed a law for, quote, balanced treatment of creation science and evolution. The law also defined what evolution is, quote, scientific evidence supporting evolution. It defined what creation science is, quote, scientific evidence supporting creation. Immediately, aggressive litigation was put into action by a powerful organization which is firmly directed against traditional Judeo-Christian principles. The influential ACLU, or American Civil Liberties Union, equipped with over 500 active attorneys, invested huge amounts of money and successfully protested the law. The, one of the biggest problems you have with the ACLU is that they're so well funded. They get millions and millions of dollars from large foundations and from wealthy people all across America. That's what they did to us. They tied us up in court in Louisiana. We filed uh, a slim brief of 630 pages with 2,000 footnotes um, arguing that creation science is constitutional to teach, scientific in content, and as non-religious as evolution. The uh, U.S. District Court judge entered a summary judgment against us nonetheless, saying that creation science involves the concept of creation which implies a creator which is inherently religious. The ACLU was able to convince the Supreme Court that creation science was basically religious. The court violated the Constitution by redefining the First Amendment author's intention 
which is against favoring any one religion above another. In their decision, the Supreme Court favored naturalistic evolution, a belief of religious humanists. Despite overwhelming scientific evidence supporting creation science, the court ruled that creationism should not be given mandatory status in public schools, but could be taught alongside evolution at the teacher's discretion. Irresponsible and slanted journalism labeled the case as religion versus science, and falsely reported that creation science had been banned from the classroom. The U.S. Supreme Court did not say that any teaching of a theory of creation is unconstitutional. It specifically reaffirmed the right of teachers to teach all the scientific evidence on the subject of origins. The scientific community is very seriously worried about the growth of creationism as an attack on the uh, validity and the autonomy of science, and particularly in the insistence that creationism be taught in the public schools in science courses. There's a very strong network and general feeling that creation, theories of creation, maybe theories of abrupt appearance, are a menace to science. Let me mention several organizations that actively today try to prevent it from being taught in public schools. Committees of Correspondence, People for the American Way, the American Humanist Association, the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Academy of Sciences, the National Education Association, the National Association of Biology Teachers, and the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study. Now, there is one anti-scientific theory today that most threatens the whole nature of scientific inquiry. It is creationism. Today we really have an organized conspiracy in this country in every state that is organized to fight the open hearing of scientific evidences on origins. The result was the forming of a loose network of active organi organizations that will cooperate to combat the creationist intrusion into the public schools, public museums, national and state parks, and the governmental funding of science research. They have a very specific desire to preserve the exclusive teaching of evolution and to exclude any teaching of a scientific theory of creation or a scientific theory of abrupt appearance. That's censorship in my view. We have today what is unquestionably the worst case of censorship. Good scientific data that happens to make it look bad for evolution, but that is meticulously censored from the textbooks. In an American society where we have always taken great pride in freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of belief, freedom of press, it's just so unfortunate that we have such great censorship in our scientific community today. Evolutionists will not acknowledge the scientific data supporting creation. They believe the creationists' only intention in presenting such facts is to push their religious bias. By successfully blurring the issues, evolutionists have falsely established evolution as scientific fact and strongly concealed its own religious affiliation. Most world religions except Judeo-Christianity are formed on the myth of biological evolution. One prominent world religion today gaining much popularity through celebrities like Shirley MacLaine is known as the New Age Movement or the New Consciousness Movement. At its heart is reincarnation and karma, both part of evolution which is based in Eastern mysticism. The New Age movement is asking us to recognize our oneness by accepting the idea that we all evolved from the same pond. And if we can unite our minds and spirits using techniques such as meditation and channeling, we can supposedly get incredible powers, achieve global unity. New Age is an interrelated network of various philosophies and political causes. Its goal is to promote an awareness of global oneness physically and mystically. Everybody from Jesus Christ to Adolf Hitler would be seen as someone who we can identify with because we are all one. I think that certainly there is every potential for all of us as spiritual beings to merge as one. We've mastered the evolution of the physical body. We've mastered the evolution of the mind or we're moving in that direction. So we're coming to a time where we're using this perfected, quasi-perfected body this opening and, and perfecting mind to access the true perfection of the universe, which is the spiritual dimension. According to New Ages, the next phase of mankind's evolution is 
elevation to godhood, they see the human race as a transitional form between apes and God. And that's, I think, our purpose on Earth, and I think we're understanding that. It's to make ourselves whole, to become one with ourselves, and then to realize our godhood. And I believe that everyone has Christ consciousness within themselves, and all they need to do is go inside and realize that, and bring it forward, and be that Christ consciousness. Evolution, whether biological or mystical, is man's way to explain away God and his creation and put man in God's place. Man has basically got the biological future of the earth in his hands. Uh, he can control evolution. We're in a time now where man is literally taking control of his own evolution, taking control of where mankind goes, both individually and collectively. I believe that the New Age movement is heading into the mainstream of American consciousness. And I think that it's going to get there by exposure in the mass media. The ideas, the concepts, the principles, the psychology, the spirituality. I think that this is a movement that will go all the way around the earth and ultimately serve as a vehicle to transform levels of consciousness that will allow us to live in a more uh, natural, harmonious way with, with the elements and with, um, with the universe. This mushrooming philosophy should be a burning concern for Christians to try and understand so that they can become effective Christian witnesses. Not only is God's character at stake here, but his truth and morality. The desire for Godhood, which is the goal of the New Age consciousness movement, is the same thing that brought about the fall of man. In being our own gods, we can justify our behavior and are accountable to no one. In the Bible, Romans chapter 1 warns us about the natural consequences of rejecting God the Creator. It results in man becoming involved in wickedness and moral corruption. As a result of the work of evolution, unbelief and skepticism are rampant in our society, and the moral and ethical effects have been devastating. If there is a moral governor in the universe, then each person in this universe is responsible to that moral governor. The easiest thing in man's mind to do is just to dismiss the possibility of that moral governorship. Adolf Hitler used the Darwinian thesis of natural selection, the survival of the fittest, to weed out who he considered to be the inferior strand of humanity. He brutally tortured and killed 12 million people, 6 million Jews and 6 million non-Jews. In effect, we are doing the same thing today with abortion, euthanasia and infanticide weeding out those whom we consider to be unwanted persons. Since 1973 in the USA alone, nearly 25 million unborn human beings were killed by abortion. That is one baby every 20 seconds. If we deny that man is created in the image and likeness of God, then we lose the dignity and purpose of life. If we agree with the evolutionary premise that we are no more than evolved animals, then humankind loses all moral perspectives. People don't want to take responsibility for their actions. They don't want God looking over their shoulder. Evolution is nothing more than an elaborate path one takes to run away from God. I stopped running and gave my heart to Jesus Christ, and all the scientific facts I'd been struggling with fell into place. We can either choose to look to evolution for the answers, or we can choose to consider an alternative. Just look at the vastness of the universe with its galaxies, solar systems, the planets, all circulating in perfect precision. There are more stars than grains of sand in all the world. Just think of the complexity of life, the intricacies of the eye, the ear, the heart, or the human brain. Is it logical to assume it all happened by random chance? Or was there an awesome creator and designer behind it all? The Bible says that man is without excuse because all around him he can see through the evidence of nature the mighty workings of a creator God.